2 Timothy chapter 1. Now take note, this is Paul writing a letter to an individual. I like the fact that we just sang the song, he knows my name. Names signify individuality. Mm -hmm. Thank God that uh, though I know he deals with nations and countries and tribes and peoples and families, I'm glad that he deals with the individual. So let's all stand for the reading of the word. If you can, Sister Verdell, I understand. If there ain't nothing wrong with you, stand up. Timothy, stand up. Amen. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers. You listen, it's going to make more sense later. You, you can't miss anything because... If the message goes as I feel it should, everything ties together. From my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Everybody say ministry. It don't stop at nighttime or inconvenient time or during dark seasons or night seasons or tough seasons. Are you hearing me? Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Mm. When I call to remembrance the undefamed faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. Hey everybody, it gets passed down. What are you passing down? And thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Hmm. Wherefore, now because of all this, because of Paul's talking about his forefathers, he's talking about uh, Timothy's predecessors, and he's saying, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hand. When you got that Holy Ghost, young man, you're going to have to stir it up. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, why do you say that? Because you face fearful things. <laughs> now, don't, don't go quiet when we read it out of the Bible. You jump in and shouting when you were singing words of that song. Because all I'm doing is saying scripturally what we just had in them lyrics. <laughs> Which is in thee by the putting of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now a sound mind in God is craziness to the world. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your tender mercies, your love. God, we ask for a move of your spirit today. We need your presence, your unction, your anointing. Lord, as we set off into a brand new year, the only thing that'll make it better is if we are a brand new us. God, I pray for an impartation of understanding, of anointing, of a move of God in our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirits to do the will of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise as we're seated. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I want to quickly thank the youth team that took uh, the young people down to Conqueror's Conference. 
appreciate the sacrifice, the effort, the time, and the patience. Amen. Well, there are 362 days left in this year. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if any of you have reached your goals yet for this year. I hope in saying that, that you have some desires to accomplish some things of value this year. I hope that in your walk with God, you've set some goals in regards to your closeness to him. Eve's dropping a little bit on uh, watch night. I listened to some wonderful folks talk about, you know, I'm not where I should be. I'm not always where I should be. I'm not always where I could be. Can, can we say amen? amen? I want a closer walk. I could use more prayer. I could fit in more prayer. I could use more Bible study. I could fit in more Bible study. You know, that eternal stuff. If you haven't said any, then I guess really I'm here to remind you of your calling as a Christian and to admonish you, like Paul admonished his charge, Timothy, stir it up. Elbow your neighbor and say, stir it up. Don't waste this year with aimless wandering of worldliness and foolishness. Have something in God to show for it if we make it to 2022. <laughs> in 1 Corinthians 9 and 20, Paul makes an amazing statement of the level of single-mindedness that is needed to win this Christianity race, this contest he talks about this. He says, and under the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law as without the law. Being not without the law to God but under the law to Christ. That, 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 and I'm not stuttering, that He's, the, he's about to denote his purpose. Gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. And then he clarifies it all. I am made all things to all men that I might by some means. All means save some. This I do for the gospel's sake. He uses the word all there a lot, and he talks a lot of different uh, uh, subcultures in society. In other words, he's focused on one thing. Christianity. The work of Christianity is to reach the lost. Anything else is a distraction. Anything else, when you step from this side of the natural into the spiritual, you're going to realize anything where moth, rust, doth corrupt, anything of the world is a waste of time. Now, there are needful things and there are distractful things. So, Paul, his single purpose is about Christ and not himself. He goes on, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not. He's not done talking, folks. That they which run in a race run all. But one. There's one type that wins. There's one type that receives the reward, the prize. Only those focused on the goal that are not distracted. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in some things. <laughs> he 
uses that word quite a bit. Now they, speaking of athletes or the carnal, do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run. He's running the race that is set before him. I run, I act, I do, I'm involved. My prayer, my, my, my whole purpose, not as uncertainty. I'm not confused about what I'm doing. So fight I. He's, he's to understand there's a run, there's a fight, not as one that beat at the air, but I keep under my body this flesh that wants you to pamper it, spoil it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And bring it into subjection. Everybody say submission. We got to allow God and someone to have veto power in our life. Lest that by any means a distraction from my purpose when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I want you to see something. I want you to put that picture up for me. This is, this is uh, a young man, as I was doing some studying late last night, I didn't watch the game, don't know nothing about it, but what I researched after I saw this on, on Twitter, that is a sophomore cornerback for the Cincinnati Bearcats. His name is Justin Harris. They have just lost the Peach Bowl by a last second field goal by the Georgia Bulldogs. The defeated team that he's on, everybody's in the locker room. He's standing by himself on the sidelines. You know what he's watching? He is watching the trophy ceremony. Mm-hmm. He's watching the opposition receive a trophy. He spent his entire college year working for. Mm -hmm. It's a trophy he wanted. It was a ceremony he wanted. They were supposed to win. They were seated number eight and they just lost to the number nine seed. They lost when they should have won. In a last second field goal. He's the only member of the team not sulking in the locker room. He was so affected by not reaching his goal that he stood on the sidelines and watched the winning team receive their trophy. He wanted a reminder to be forever imprinted to never forget his goals, his purpose, and remind him that every day from here out to work harder as to never be the person watching somebody else get what you should have fought for. Paul has made a declaration to Timothy and to all Christians about running and about fighting to win the prize. Peter denotes in 1 Peter 2 and 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You ought not to blend in. There ought to be no question as to what you're about. You ought to be able to be recognized by your choices, by your life, by how you talk, by what's important in your life. Mm -hmm. That you should show forth uh, the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. In one of the commentaries, Albert Barnes uses the term darkness is the emblem of ignorance, sin, and misery. And refers here to their condition before their conversion. Hoping some get converted today. Light is the emblem of the opposite and is a beautiful representation of the state of those who are brought to the knowledge of the gospel. 
Anybody here ever been called? That's not a trick question. I, I'll raise two hands if y'all are too embarrassed to raise your hand. God called me. He called me out of darkness. He called me. Uh huh. I, 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 I say this with trepidation, not that I doubt, but that it's, I'm humbled. I, to be called to minister, to preach, to you, you just see me up here doing this, but you don't understand when, I, when God called me, I couldn't hold a conversation very well. I was coming out of the world, of, well, I don't want to go into all that, but I just did a lot of things to myself. I should have been dead. Mm-hmm. But if you've been called out of darkness... You've been called into the light. You've been called to be more. If you are the type of person who knows you're called, but every time it gets tough, you want to go back to the natural, you've never been fully persuaded. I don't care how long it's been. The moment you want to go back to the natural and don't, everywhere you read in Scripture, When you read in the New Testament, I must decrease that he. Why don't, why aren't we like that? Why is it that we are, this is just how I am. Well, you need a good praying through. Well, I've always done this and I've always done it that way. God's not stuck. God's not dead. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. You are called to dispel darkness. Why? You switch sides. No one's life speaks louder of switching sides than Paul. His conversion, that 180, that completely turning the world upside down stuff. Uh, You have to understand something. Has anybody else here been called? In that time that your life starts turning upside down, what you used to do, what you used to be involved in, how you used to walk, how you used to talk, what you used to listen to, where you used to go. If you're called to be a giant slayer and you're called to be a light and you're called to bring praise to God, Shouldn't we still be called to do that? Let me give you some important names. Men of influence. Chosen men. These were leaders. Men who had a voice in leadership. Names that were synonymous with leaders. How many remembers the name of Shemua, Shaphat, Igal, Palti, Gadiel, Gadai, Amiel. Y'all ain't jumping and shouting. Sethur, Nabi, Geul. Affected the lives of thousands and possibly millions. Their choices, their decisions, their conduct, their actions had an effect for years and years upon the people of God. Anybody know who I'm talking about yet? All these Bible reads, nobody jumping up and down. Well, in all honesty, they're forgettable. They are. Though they were leaders, they were called, they were chosen. Sadly, by their actions, by their choices, by their words, by their statements. They don't belong next to the names of the great leaders that we know. 
We don't remember that. You're not jumping up and down and going, yeah. But you will when you realize who they rub shoulders with. See, these men, though they shared the stage and time with some of the greatest of the greats, failed to see, to walk, to talk, and to act like those leaders. Those men that I listed to you were the ten other spies that were rubbing shoulders with the likes of Joshua and Caleb. But Caleb and Joshua were different. The Bible says in Numbers 14, 24, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went and his seed shall possess it. In fact, that's the contrast that I want to point out for us today. What impact will you have on those around you? What influence when it comes to the things of God is your name going to be synonymous with? Half-hearted for the world? Vacillating between lukewarm Or a full throttle all in for God. Maybe an indifferent attitude. What message is your life sending? What are our actions writing and saying about each of us as a called believer? Mm. That young man, if you read the inscription of the text that was placed on it has now drawn the attention of the opposing team. In fact, the opposing team supporter said, I see you. Made the statement that you are probably going to be the most formidable opponent ever on that team because he stood there and watched somebody else get what he should have got. Watched somebody else do what he should have did and they realized... There all needs to get a fire set off in you about the things of God when you start realizing things are passing you by and goals and victories and, and maybe maybe people you should have won and Bible studies you should have taught, messages you should have preached, and prayers you should have prayed, things of God that have escaped you because you've been busy playing around at the things of God. Understand in Numbers 13, here's how it all got started. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, shall ye send a man. Every one a ruler among them. Every one of those names. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. folks got a mandate in which direction does your influence flow are you throwing in the towel or wiping your brow are you having faith in God or are you questioning everything in our text you would think listen to me that nothing could have kept Israel out of the promised land Deliverance like that from Egypt? Watching a miraculous delivery and deliverance and just the ability to walk out of slavery of 400 years? To watch God turn around and do miraculous things to get you out? You think by the time they got to, got to that border, <laughs> I'm ready to fight. <laughs> I'm ready for the promise. I just watched God do that. This is going to be a piece of cake. You would think nothing would have stopped. Can you imagine as they all waited, staring at the border of the promised land, knowing that 
12 of the best men just went to check it out to create a plan, to get an idea how we're going how we're going to take what's already been given. How we're going to possess what's already been handed to us. Mm. They waited on the border of Canaan for the return of those spies. 40 days waiting, getting excited. Ah, we're fixing to finally go home. We're fixing to finally get our promises. We're fixing to finally get that land flowing with milk and honey. We're finally, yeah, I'm ready for the promise. Poised, prepared. Assurance of success from God Almighty. God's promise of victory. They had witnessed God's divine power. All the miracles in the wilderness and God's divine presence. They had been slaves in Egypt. And God delivered them and showed himself to be all powerful, all knowing, and everywhere present. They knew how powerful God was. They knew what he could do. This shows us how easily even the so-called self-proclaimed elite can vacillate between faith and doubt to the detriment of those they lead or influence. This story demonstrates the power of a real believer. See, a real believer, no matter if it's raining or sunshine, is a believer. Whether it goes their way or not is a believer. <laughs> That's the real power of a real believer. They, they, they can even be standing side by side with the undecided and have a made up mind. It's dangerous to share decisions and choices with those that aren't fully persuaded. It's critical to understand the dynamics of a situation like this. Understand that when the spies came back and they got the uh, record, it says in Numbers 14, 1 through 6, and all the congregation lifted up their voice, they cried. And the people wept all that night. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in this wilderness? They don't believe that. <laughs> if you're willing to die then, why don't you take the promise and die trying to get that if you're going to die? Mm. I'm not going to get into all that. It's, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey. They've already been slaves for 400 years. What? You've been walking in the wilderness. You've been stuck for 40 days. <sighs> what they do? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us, let's change leadership. Let's question leadership. Carnal people question leadership. Oh, they're there to help get you out. They'll preach right to get you out of sin. But you won't listen when they try to get you into the promised land. Oh, preach me out positive out of my drug addiction. Out of my love for the things of the world. But lay off when it comes to getting me to the promised land. I'm going to find someone that just tells me what I like to hear. Then Moses and Aaron fell on faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. You know what didn't stop there? It said in Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. On a personal level, as an individual, what you actually believe affects everything. Mm -hmm. What you actually believe and put into action will affect your de de destiny. God hasn't robbed, stolen from any man. 
But I can tell you there are many men that have ripped themselves off by doubt, by stopping their trust in God and their faith in God. Understand that your lack of faith and mistrust of God can change your eternity. And it will also affect all those around you. Watch what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He says, brethren, when I came to you, listen to this, listen folks, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Very simple. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ. You know why I had to say that? Because he knew other junk and just didn't want. <laughs> I determined. I just, I get all that. But you have to understand something. This is how you make it, folks. <laughs> Determined to not know anything among you save Jesus Christ and crucified. And I was with you in weakness. I'm weak too. And in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Now listen to this. But in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I'm not, he's not talking about miracles and signs and wonders. That's not what he's talking about. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He's not talking about crazy miracle signs and wonders, even though that can happen. He's talking about staying faithful in the face of adversity. He's talking about not changing your mind when things aren't going your way. He's talking about staying faithful, though others are getting fearful. He's talking about walking on mountains. Keep walking in valleys. Keep walking in sickness. Keep walking in struggle. Not wavering. Not struggling in what I'm doing. Things can be tossed and turned. But my mind's not. My heart's fixed. My mind's made up. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 11, 24 in our little study this morning. What are you talking about, Paul? He gives us a list of things he's gone through that... Now, I'm going to hurt our feelings today because we're in spoiled America. If we could see ourselves in the spirit, I don't want to hurt, but we all, we look like that fat baby with a diaper with those big old safety pins and a big old lollipop in our hand. <laughs> Change my diaper, let me have a, I'm my. I can't make it to prayer. I can't make it to church. I can't read my, we just want God to do everything for us. I know, I know this ain't encouraging. But it will be when you get it. I need some of you to get that attitude you got when you was a teenager. I got this. Well, I'm glad you finally learned how to use a restroom for yourself. Ain't nothing worse than a grown up, an adult, an elder that's talking in a way he needs his diaper changed or she needs... Or binky. Listen to what he says here. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. Night and a day I've been in the deep. What's your problem? In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own. Uh huh. Hello? Am I getting through? Anybody? Uh, okay. In perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. I'm with you. But you don't do what I want. In weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst. Ain't American ain't hungry and thirst for jack all in a hundred years around here. 
and fastings out. Well, that left a whole bunch out. And coldness and nakedness. Besides those that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of. This don't spank you, but it spanks me because I'm just barely able to handle one. He's got plural churches here. Who is weak? And I'm not weak. Who is offended? And I'm very much. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. <laughs> In verse 32, in Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, kept the city of Damascus, Damascus, with a garrison desires to apprehend. I'm here, I'm here in chains. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped. When's the last time you rode a basket? Oh, I was probably about 15 going through Kmart or Walmart and got one of them baskets and let someone. What's he saying? Keep walking no matter what you go through. Stay faithful to God when things are going upside down. Why? Because your influence is those people watching you. you I got faith in God. I'm going to be a church. I'm going to be praising. I'm going to be worship. I'll still be singing and preaching and doing and walking with my head up because I'm walking in the power of God. You keep going in spite of the struggle. You keep going in spite of the fight. Faith without works is dead. Being alone, James said in chapter 2, 17 through 20, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Being alone, what's he? Keep walking. Keep showing up. Keep lifting your hands. Keep teaching Bible stuff. Keep loving the lost. Uh, keep becoming, I become all things to all men. That by all means, I might stay focused. When you get discouraged to quit, that's because you've gotten carnal. Figure it out. It's the truth. I know when I want to quit, it's when I'm basing everything on how I So faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Is your faith dead? Does it need resurrecting? Yeah, man may say, thou hast faith and I have worked. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my work. Well, keep walking. Stay faithful. The race is not to the swift. Ah, it's for those who stay faithful. Thou believest that there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also bleed and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works? Don't be caught up in the vanity of the things of this world. It will cause you to stop walking in faith. And you'll... Listen. No one expected the spies report to come back like that. Nobody expected when those men, those elders, those leaders walked back into the congregation for some say, well, I don't know, guys. I'll be honest with you. I think we need to pack this Jesus stuff in. I think it's best we just all quit, backslide, and go to hell. I think that might be easier. Let's deny the Holy Ghost. Let's quit being faithful. Let's quit teaching. Let's quit loving people. Because this, this being faithful when my car broke down, or this being faithful when my wife is sick, or this being faithful when I got health problems, or this being faithful, man. <laughs> when you put it that way, it kind of gets you irritated at your thinking, don't it? And that does me. bothers me that a sophomore in college can go through the biggest defeat in his life and he's standing there on the sidelines watching him celebrate and he's going I'm going to get mine I'm going to get mine see 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 some I, I may not get all of you and some of you may want to throw in the towel you may throw your hands up quick and throw, get mad and upset and backslid and shout and get 
cuss and moan at me. But I'm trying to find a Caleb and a Joshua spirited person in here. I'm looking for someone that can quit being a crybaby and pick up that Bible and get called to God again. Get called to God again. Get that anointing again. Maybe you just need to quit belly aching. Push that plate. Fast and get a hold of it. Oh, Let him get back a hold of you. Get that fire shut up in your bones that you cannot say. Push some of that junk aside. Get rid of the distractions. Get rid of the worldliness. Get rid of the carnality. And say, you know what? I'm in this to win this. Let me see a little bit. I'm, I'm preaching to me right now. I'm not preaching to you. I've almost. Anybody ever been robbed before? I'm not a good guy when I catch the people that robbed me. Oh, that story I got to tell you is this is a worldly story and it's a carnal to bad story. And that's the only one I got. See, back in the old days, they made it legal now, so it's not as big deal to you. But back in the old days, you weren't supposed to smoke that funny green stuff. stash and had some friends over and <laughs> you just can't picture me doing that my long hey y'all wouldn't be invited you'd be too scared to invite me to church <laughs> I'll probably rob you before you get the words out of your mouth <laughs> well so we fired up a ball and I kicked them out and went on to work Come home, me and a friend, and well, yeah, we're going to chill. And y'all, y'all think you're just now learning how to chill? No, we was chilling back in the day, weren't we, brother Lawrence? We were chilling like a villain before some of you were even born. I walked in there and I go grab my bong box. I had it all set up, you know. I opened it up, and my stash was gone. You know, and I had company, so I was like. More than one part of my evening now. So I went ahead and put everything back, took her home, and I got in my car. Because I walked around and I looked out, they got in through my window and I saw that finger slide. And I looked at them fingers. I got in that Ford 390, that, five, that, that Ford 500 XL. I'm driving up and down the streets with the same jokers that I partied with before I went to work. And sure enough, I found them walking down the street. I took that thing and I pulled it right up on the sidewalk right in front of the junk out. And I got in both their faces and grabbed them. I just about strip searched both of them. You don't mess with a man when he's angry like that. They had the fear of God in their eyes, and I was mad. Well, how am I going to find something that's already in their lungs? <laughs> I don't like to get ripped off. Some of us have got, uh, hello? Y'all like being, if you like being stolen from, let me know. I, I can raise an offering right here. Just let me know how much you got in your pocket. We'll take it if you like it. Sad thing is, is most of us rip ourselves off. The most stealing I've ever done in my life is stole from myself. I wonder how many times I've robbed myself of the plan of God. I wonder how many times I robbed myself of being more anointed and more powerful and doing more because I robbed myself by being distracted by things that don't matter, by spending time on this, by doubting and not having faith, and getting an attitude with my brother or my sister or getting mad at the preaching or the teaching. They didn't let me sing or they didn't sing my Whatever it is that gets you sideways, that gets you at home mully grubbing and angry and sideways in your flesh towards the things. You know what's happening? The devil couldn't take it from you, so he tricked you to take it from yourself. So when those messengers returned, those ten that discouraged the people stopped them from going into Canaan. 
Now, we know Caleb and Joshua encouraged the people to go forward. Listen, listen to what Caleb says. He does not say, let us go up and conquer it. This matters, folks. Listen, if you, if you get, get this from this teaching this morning. He said, let us go and possess it. It's a mindset. It's an understanding. It's been given to you. There's going to be difficulties that are in our way. But they will dwindle and vanish before our active faith in the power and the promises of God. Just like they he parted the Red Sea just like he got them out of Egypt. They needed just to keep walking and keep going. All oh, things are possible when you go on what God said. It does nothing change today. Stop belly aching. Stop losing faith. Still, when there's a problem, that's the opportunity to shine. That's a testimony. That's a light in the darkness. Those who trust the promises of God and follow his directions will find that his promises are true. Caleb looks at the situation. has already been done. Let's just go get it. Let's just go possess it. Let's just go do it. There's nothing else to be done but to enter without delay and take possession of what God wants to hand us. It's really sad that those spies, ten spies, made this statement. We're grasshoppers in our sight, and we're grasshoppers in their sight. Maybe I need to go read that again. But last I checked, they didn't speak to any giants. In fact, the giants didn't even know they were there. Yet they saw themselves as grasshoppers and assumed that the giants would see them that way. How many of you get defeated before you even get started because of your own words, your own thoughts, your own ideas? But let me ask this question, and I don't mean to hyperanalyze this, but I just want to give you something to think about because it's just how I roll. Why a grasshopper? They're smaller insects, Carol. Right? Ladybug. Ant. Little, little things. Flies. But instead they said grasshoppers. I, I really don't believe it really was so much a size issue, but an attitude issue that they had. Your attitude matters, especially about yourself, about this church, and about those around you, because they didn't call themselves locusts. How much difference is a grasshopper, a grasshopper and a locust? Not much, but just enough. Locusts are aggressive and work together. They, when they get unified and get moving, are unstoppable. <laughs> you can tell when the locusts have been around. You can tell when the locusts are unified and swarming. They take the land. <laughs> But they called themselves that little timid grasshopper, that, that self-preservation cousin of the locust, which is known for its ability to have a color to blend into its surroundings. And the defensive instead of on the off. This is a word for us today because just because you come to church don't mean you're still not trying to hide. You're just trying to blend in 
try to get by without being unified to the cause and kind of stay to yourself and I don't want to get involved. Well, that's disunity. That's what the ten were doing. The children of Israel got spiritually lazy. They wanted everything without walking in faith. They just wanted everything without any type of effort. They complained and forgot about what God had already done for them. They wanted God to do it all for them. They didn't want to have to do a thing. They saw their promised land. All they saw was milk and honey, but they didn't want to see the walking and possessing part. Somewhere along the way, churches and church leaders have decided that God's promises are not worth the fight. It's not important that I'm at prayer night this week. I don't want to fight that hard. I just want God to give me victory. I don't need to come to an altar. I'm way past that. I don't need to worship and praise in church. I've grown out of that. They want the milk and honey. You want the milk and honey. Jesus called this type of church a lukewarm church. They can take it or leave it. Commitment's not too important. They're just busy with self-preservation. Now understand, listen to me now. This moment, this moment in, in, in Israel's history is still affecting them today. According to the rabbinic tradition, as seen as in the Misnatanic, the sin of the spies produced an annual fast day of Tisha B'Av. It is the saddest day on the Jewish calendar. It is a day right now to this day on which they fast, deprive themselves, and pray. It is a culmination of the three weeks, a period of time during which they mark the destruction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. It's when the Israelites accepted that false report. They wept over the false belief that God was setting them up for defeat. And the night the people cried as in the ninth of Ab. The ninth, which is July 29th, August. That moment, right? They still recognize, well, I'll put it this way, the boneheaded move that they did. To this day, that moment of lack of faith, those 10 leaders, those 10 influential men brought centuries of pain upon the people still today. The 10 spies' names are forgotten, but what they've done is not. But those two spies that we're faithful. Those two men who spoke faith. Those two men who still said we could take it. Those two men who regardless of what all the other so-called leaders say. We still know their names today. We still name our children those names today. We still get some Caleb's and some Joshua's today. Why? Because of what they're associated with. Because they can't walk in no matter what happens. Listen to me. 40 years of unwavering desire. 40 years of faith while watching the wretched wine. 40 years of trust while they keep watching. Are you, are you hearing me? And whining over a fight they were ready to wait. 40 years of not giving up, 40 years of worshiping and waiting, 40 years of refusing to buy into the mindset of the mediocre, 40 years of undistracted purpose, 40 years of dedication to an old promise, 40 years of trust, 40 years of faith, 40 years of being surrounded by the surrendered. I said that for those of you, you don't have to get with this church if you don't want to. But we're going forward regardless. Uh, 40 years of waking up every day and staying faithful to God. What 14,610 days of commitment. 21,037,960 minutes, 8 minutes of faithfulness. And every minute mattered to them. They didn't waste it on the things of this world. 
they stayed faithful. Caleb and Joshua had a hope that transcended the trouble they faced. They had faith in God, even though they were forced to suffer at the hand of unbelievers. You can still live for God, even though what God's promised you has been delayed at the hand of the depressed. They still hoped in God. They knew God would keep his promises. Caleb was so intent on receiving his promise that not only did he keep himself spiritually fit, but he kept himself physically fit. Some of y'all need to take better care of your health. If you want to be a part of what God's doing, take care. Well, hello, preaching to me. You got a whole group sitting at a table New Year's night. We're going to do better, Sister Carol. Sister Crow, we're going to do better. Why? We want to be around to see God do some things. We want to be around to see God save some of our loved ones. We want to be, hey, you know why? We, you know why we're saying it? I'm not done. Well, maybe you are. I'm not done. Oh, God, give me a brand new congregation. Come on, then. Give me some people that want to believe. Give me some people that say, you know what? I want to be in this to win this. I want to be in this to the finish line. I'm not, hey, uh, if you really want to live to 120, do you want to be a useless 120 or I want to be a busy 120? See, see, y'all don't even know. I'm walking pretty good right now. You ought to see me after I sat down for just five minutes. Man, they stiff up, they cramp, they stop. Stiff my eye. This, this, Wretched thing. I told Sister Carl, oh, hold on. No, I'm going to press through this. I'll be walking like nothing's wrong. Kind of. <laughs> but you know what I'm going to do? Keep walking. I'm not, I'm not ready to quit. I haven't preached my last message. I haven't taught my last Bible study. I haven't won my last soul. I got some things I may do in the world, but I won't trade on none of that. I want the things of God. I want the things of God. I let all that go. Not a one of it means a hill of beans to me next to this. Joshua, it says in Joshua 14, 11 and 12, Caleb says this. Caleb says this. As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. You ought to be just as strong today as the day God called you. You ought to get up. And if you're not, you ought to stir up yourself. Hey, what did Paul tell, what did Paul tell Timothy? Stir it up, boy. Stir it up, boy. You're still called. Stir it up, church. You're still called. Come on, Brother Bruce. You got messages to preach. You got Bible studies to teach. You got people to win. You got people to baptize. You got people to love. You got, oh. I'm as strong right now as the day you called me, Lord. Send me up. Give me my mountain. My, as my strength was then. It's sad that the only time you've got strength, vigor, and joy is to do something for the world. Watch me. Brother Corey, it's a good thing you're a worshiper because I see you doing that crazy basketball stuff out there with them kids. Well, how could you do less in here? How can we go all day doing the things of the world and walk in here and move me, preacher? Man, I ain't got to move you. You still up there. You got the Holy Ghost? Stir yourself. Now, hold on. Let me, let me get through some of this critical stuff. Get to something. Let's let's be real. So I'm not talking about it being easy and just blindly walk as an idiot taking arrows to the chest. No. But Lulu, how does somebody want a mountain? Want another challenge? Want another victory? After all this time, forty years. Shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of deadbeats. Shoulder to shoulder, just looking at them jokers who stopped you, who hindered you, who influenced the situation. They're 
over there getting old and fat and dying. And old Caleb was going to push us. Caleb got that keto going on. He's eating right. He's doing right. He's running his laps. <laughs> uh-huh. He ain't eating no more than jelly beans. He dropped, he's not eating two bagels at one shot. He's dropped it down to no bagels now. He's going, uh-huh. He's watching his salt into, why? I got plans. Because God gave me promises. I got plans. Because God gave me promises. Why are you praying, Caleb? I got promises. Uh, why are you fasting, Caleb? I got promises. Hey, saint of God, why are you up here praying? Why are you not? I got promises. I got another mountain to climb. I got another victory ahead of me. The Bible says that Caleb had another spirit in him. The spirit of God makes all the difference. That's why it's so important that you become a born again believer. That you follow Acts 2.38. That you get baptized in Jesus name. And you get full of the Holy Ghost. It's important that you repent daily. In other words you repent. You say God not my will. But thy yes. will be done. Yes. That's a daily thing. Too many of us have treated Jesus like a little puppy. Come on Jesus this is what we're doing today. And we wonder why there's no miracles. You won't get miracles. You become the little puppy and follow Jesus. And what of the flesh. If you turn around and you can brag about stuff in the world and you can brag about the things of the world, but you don't have nothing to say about the things of God. You've been focusing on the wrong things. If you analyze Joshua's leadership, he's a failure. He only got one into the promised land from his original. <laughs> he said, but he only got Caleb in. Let me say this. Look, if you're only going to get one in, make sure it's a Caleb. <laughs> I'm looking for a Caleb today. I'm looking for <laughs> what a success story. What an amazing man. I'll take a Caleb over those other 10 any day. Listen to this. Adversity is not abandonment. Struggle is not God leaving you. Let me tell you why God held Joshua and Caleb over. They were to lead the children of the unbelievers into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb's calling was the exact same despite that delay. Joshua and Caleb's faith was to be transferred to the children of the unbeliever rather than the unbelief of the parents. Caleb's mountain was more than dirt and rocks, rough terrain, and side hills. He was defeating bitterness. He was defeating brokenness. He was defeating disappointment, depression, and anger, and frustration. He had another spirit in him. He had it in the natural, and he had it in the spiritual. Hallelujah. He said, I got a mountain coming. I'm going to stay in this fight. I'm going to stay in this thing. He wasn't going to lose. Being surrounded by the surrenderers. He stayed faithful. At some point. As we stand. In your life as a believer. As. That you're going to have to make up. Your mind. There are all kinds of giants to fear. You have to decide, do you want giants or do you want God? God are the promises, blessings, provisions. 
The giants are the enemies and adversaries to the promises of God. Giants are employed by the devil to resist you, frustrate you, and steal the promises of God for your life. He may, the devil may never get you to stop believing in God. He just wants you to stop acting like it. Get on the sidelines. Saul had a giant. David had a God. When you seek the promises of God, let's, let's be real right here for a while. When you seek the promises of God and you, you stay faithful to God, you're going to bother people. You're going to scare some people. When you talk big about the things of God and you think big about the things of God and you plan big about the things of God and you worship big and praise big and give big, you're going to bother those that aren't fully persuaded. When you make bold statements like Joshua and Caleb, you boldly declare that we are well able. We can do it. When you are aggressive in your faith and you become bold in your confession and profession, you are going to attract attention of the doubt. Your greatest enemies are not going to be in the world or of the world. The greatest enemies to bold, courageous, grape-grabbing, giant-killing, land-taking, promise-possessing, faithful folks, sadly, are much like what Joshua and Caleb faced. Those they rubbed shoulders. Those they possibly sit next to. Those that are around them right in the church with giants in their eyes. Joshua and Caleb were ready to go and get what belonged to them. Ten of their brethren smashed the dream. All they could see was giants. All they talked about was giants. All they can see is problems. All they can see is the negative. And it was them that decided it's not worth it. And they'll fight you. They want to fight your dream instead of the giants. They will persecute you instead of the giants. They will criticize you instead of the giants. They'll go home talking about you instead of the giants. They'll do everything they can to hinder you instead of the giants. One of the greatest struggles for most churches and Christians is their tied to the declaration. What's your declaration? Are you standing here in a life that screams, I'm a grasshopper? Well, can you hear the voice, the voice of the spirit of Caleb and Joshua? We are well able. Thomas Edison once said, the opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. In the church, it looks like prayer. It looks like Bible studies and Bible reading. It looks like church cleanup, church lawn work, and Sunday school. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. 
Opportunity is everywhere. No matter who you are, you only have to look at every situation a little differently without the preconceived notions. The ten passed on their promises because they couldn't see the whole picture that God was giving them. Carnal people can't see beyond their flesh. They can't see spiritually. They're governed worldly. They talk about their stuff. They talk about their money. They talk about their looks. They talk about their stuff. They talk about their acting. They brag about worldly things. They stand there in church and go, I'm glad I'm not like. As they look at someone beating their chest. God, I'm a sinner. Such is the case for missed opportunities. Decca Recording Company passed on the Beatles. Listen to this, Carol. Those of you old enough, we don't want to sign them. We don't like their sound and the guitar music is on its way out. In 1975, one of Kodak's main engineers invented a digital camera. 1975, folks. Y'all think y'all bad now, but but instead of an opportunity, they saw it as a threat to their film business, and they fought to suppress it. And we all know how that worked. In 2000, the Netflix CEO offered to sell to Blockbuster for 50 million. Blockbuster declined the offer and laughed at him. Today, Netflix is valued at more than 70 billion, and I think there's only one, if it's still around, left. Missed opportunities. Shaquille O'Neal was offered a chance to buy into Starbucks, but he really wasn't keen on the idea. He declined the offer, saying, you know, not, black people don't drink that much coffee. So I don't think it's going to work, what he said. Today, he says it was one of the worst business decisions of his life. Decisions matter. And your mindset matters. But my servant, Numbers 14, 24, because he had another spirit with him. And hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went and his seed shall possess it. Don't make, don't make eternal spiritual decisions from the carnal mindset. It won't only cost you, it's going to cost your children. It costs Saul. It costs Cain. It cost Esau, and it'll cost us our promises, provisions, and purpose. I can honestly tell you one of the most painful places you're going to get to when it comes to walking with the Lord. Joshua and Caleb got there. You have to be able to ready to say to even people that you love, I love you, but I don't agree with you. I love you but I'm believing God. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life in a prison of unbelief to make anybody happy. It is time for the church of the living God to stop worrying so much about the White House and get our focus back on God's house. Can I, can I say something? I'm only looking for seven today. I'd like to get 10. But if I can get seven, we can make church great again. We can make the kingdom of God our focus again. We can make the church powerful again. I know the kingdom of heaven serve of violence, but the violence take it by force. You need to get a taste for the grapes in the promised land. The promise is worth the pain.
Giants won't matter anymore. I wonder, I wonder if there's anybody here today that can say, you know what, I'm not with the ten doubters. I'm not with the unbelievers and the side steppers and the half steppers. I'm not with the ten. I'm not with those that don't have anything good to say. I'm not with those that can't see the power of God anymore. I'm not with those that are spiritually embarrassing the kingdom. Call up to the front all, all those that have different spirit in you to stand and be accounted for. Say, we are able, we're able to possess it.